Well, as we continue our study of, of narrative genre, looking at narrative genre, we now arrive to this area of uh, this aspect of scene analysis. Scene analysis. And when you think about scene analysis, um, when you study the epistles, the epistolary genre, you focus upon paragraphs. Remember how we, back in the epistles class, our first course, we divided um, everything out in terms of paragraphs. You have to think in terms of paragraphs. And paragraphs have sentences within them. When you think about narrative, you don't really think about paragraphs as much as scenes. Scenes. And so that's how you have to approach it in terms of looking at the structure of the passage of a narrative upon the sequence of scenes that appear in that passage. And that's what you have to think about. And, and so we, we want to deal with that in, in this session. What, is it, well, what are we talking about when we say scenes? What are we dealing with? So let me, let me kind of explain the procedure here. What happens at this point in, in our study of narrative genre is to help you get to the place where you, where you can do the scenes well and understand each scene and, and break each narrative account into its respective scenes. You, you first have to go back and do the textual observation assignment. Uh, that's why I put this in here. You want to start with textual observations. And when you make textual observations, you're, you're, doing, you're making those textual observations on the entire passage. Not just part of it, the entire narrative passage that you're going to preach, that you're studying. Now when you do these textual observations, when you make these textual observations, you're using the same categories that we discussed back in Expository Preaching 1, the first course. You can go back and, and review that material. We discussed each of those categories. Uh, that you're looking at, what, what, what they represent, gave you some examples of those. So you want to use those and, and, and work through them. Repetition of words, where are, where are the verbs, and all those kinds of things. Um, but there's two additional um, categories that are in that list, but we didn't talk about them. And we didn't, I didn't present them in the first course. The reason is, is these apply to narratives. These two areas, these two categories uh, that come from grasping God's word, they apply specifically to narrative passages. That's why I did not discuss them in the first course. But I'm going to discuss them in this one. And, and if you especially look at these two categories, they're going to help you in determining the scenes. By, by looking at these two categories and, 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 and making text observations and including these two categories in your understanding of, of, uh, of, of what you need to look for in the passage, if you spot these and if you see these, because every narrative has it, and you, and you understand these categories correctly, it will help you in determining the scenes. So, the first category you want to look at is shifts or pivots in the story. And what am I talking about here? Uh, is there a point in the story where an event or a dialogue, remember, narratives have dialogue and they have events, where it changes to a new event or a new set of dialogue? Maybe the characters change. Uh, maybe it's the same characters, but it's a different topic. Like, for example, in, in John 3. When Jesus and Nicodemus meet, there is only a conversation between two people. But there are various scenes, there's various shifts and pivots in that story, in that narrative, because the conversation is the changing and developing throughout that story. There's a back and forth, there's a going back and forth between Nicodemus and Jesus, and Nicodemus is answer, asking a question and Jesus is answering it. And Nicodemus responds to that, and Jesus responds back. So there's these shifts and pivots in the story in terms of the dialogue, in terms of the action, in terms of maybe the events. And so you want to be aware of those things. Now I'm going to show you in a little while a, an example of this, how this looks. Um, but you want to think about shifts and pivots in the story. And then there's a related category called interchange. Does the passage shift back and forth between two events or dialogues? What, you say, what's the difference between a shift and a pivot and an interchange? Seem very similar. A shift is a, and a pivot 
means it goes from one event or dialogue to another event dialogue to a zip to a different event dialogue. They're never the same thing. They're always something different, something new. So it shows you a progression in terms of the events or dialogue. An interchange can happen between um, two people, and so it, it's a going back and forth in regards to the same dialogue. For example, it could work like this. You could have a conversation between two people, and, and they're, at, they're talking about some issue. One asks the question, the response, another question, response, another question, response. You could have an interchange that goes back and forth three rounds, three rotations. And it may not be that many verses to it, but then that is one section. And then after those three, after the questions asked and answered, asked, answered, asked, answered, then there's a pivot or a shift to something else. So the shifts are broader in terms of the scope, in terms of how many verses you're looking at. You're going to have shifts and pivots within the, the structure of that shift or that pivot. The, the, you may have an interchange. See how it works? Um, that, that's how they complement each other. So the interchange is that you're noticing that there's events going back and forth. There's the same event or the same dis topic discussed. Maybe between two characters, Jesus and the religious leaders or Jesus and disciples or two individuals. And so that's the interchange. And the, but when it shifts to something else, when there's a change in events, a change in topic, then that's technically called a shift or a pivot. You want to be able to recognize both. Because by recognizing both, it helps you to determine how many scenes are in your account, in your narrative story, and where do those scenes show up. You need to be aware of that. Now, when we think about scenes, after you've made the textual observations and you've found the shifts and the pivots, then you've got to divide the story into the various elements. And so, or very, I'm sorry, various scenes. And, and so what you do when, you, when you're dividing it into these various scenes, you've got to notice certain, there's certain elements that it could appear in the text besides the shifts and the pivots. There's certain elements that could show up in the text that would help you to say to yourself, oh, that's the beginning of a scene. That's the ending of a scene. This is the beginning of a scene. This is the ending of a scene. Now, there's no book out there that you can look at that will tell you the breakdown of every narrative passage in terms of its scenes. You're not going to find a commentary like that. You're not going to find a book like that. Okay? You're going to have to determine this for yourself based upon looking at the passage, reading the passage, studying the passage. There's no resource out there that's going to tell you where the scenes are. It just doesn't exist. So you've got to determine that for yourself. And what I'm telling you is the way to do that is find the shifts and the pivots. Find, look at, make sure you understand and can observe the interchange that takes place. But also look at some of these other elements. These are helpful tools, helpful things that you observe in the passage that will tip you off to the fact that you may have a scene change. A scene change. First, note the time elements of the story. Is there a gap in time between one event and another event? Like, um, sometimes you'll have a passage in the Gospels that'll say, and, and after a few days, or later that day, or the next day, you, you, you see that there's a different, there's a shift there. You may would even label that as, 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 okay, here's a shift, here's a pivot. But it's also the boundaries of a, the, of, a, of a scene. So you can be thinking of it that way. There's uh, the story in Nehemiah chapter 8 where the, pe uh, the people are standing and God's word is read. Remember that? The law is read uh, by Ezra and other scribes and others. And, 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 and so the people, the whole, all the people of Israel are being uh, exposed to God's word. And, they, and, they're, and these men are explaining the word of God. They're explaining the law to them. And it's a great day. It's a wonderful day. And then after that event is described, the next scene, there's a shift, there's a pivot, and there's the introduction of a new scene because the, that, the first words of that new scene that starts that new scene 
It says on the next day. The next day. And if you read what happens on the next day, that's the day after God's word being read and explained to all the people, you see there's a difference. The heads of households, the fathers came, just the fathers, to have the word of God explained more clearly and more detailed. So there's a time gap. These time words can help you. Maybe there's a chain of events that happen, but they happen at the same time. They could be that there's the same day, but there's event changes. There's still pivots because of the events. So these are kind of time-related things, time-related elements that you want to be aware of. And if you do textual observations pretty well, you probably will observe that. So that's why I want you to do textual observations before you attempt to try to uh, divide the story into scenes. And then you could use what I call pacing elements. There could be a changing of the setting, the place, the location. Remember, we've, you've already done setting, loca uh, setting analysis. There could be a changing of the mentioning of the characters. We've already looked at character analysis. That's why we're doing them in this order. So look for changes in that. It could be environmental conditions. It, going from darkness to light, cold to heat, drought to rain. These could be things that, what I call pacing elements, that could tip you off, that could give you clues as to when there is a new scene. And there's what I call focus elements of the story. Uh, remember how the, we talked about the narrator, how the narrator is, is like a character in the story. He's like the omniscient character that describes everything. He lets the characters talk. He lets them interact with each other, but sometimes he's just describing things. A very involved narrator tells stories, gives details. As composed to a less involved narrator when the characters take over and become principal actors. So sometimes the narrator is very involved, sometimes he's less involved. And when you see changes in that, that could show shifting of scenes. It's the narrator's way of telling you that a scene shift is, has, has occurred. Because now he's talking more. And now not, not so much. So that's a possible way, another element that you can focus on where the narrator is focused in on the story and then he seems to be more taking a back seat and letting the characters talk. Again, you have to make some decisions. You have to make determinations. And, and the best way to do this is see an example. We're going to show you an example of all this in just a little bit. Now, once you know what your scenes are, I'm going to conclude this part here uh, with this. Once you know what your scenes are, the particular scenes, then you've got to describe it. There's a way to go about describing it. You need to describe the character levels of interactions that happen with each other in that scene. And we'll, again, we're going to show you an example of this. You need to describe any noticeable themes that are apparent. Describe any thoughts that are generated in you. As you read that scene, as you see that development, as you read that story, and you see what's happening and what's being said, what, what, what thoughts come to your mind? What emotions come to you? How does that make you feel? How does that, how does that make you feel on the inside? So what are your thoughts and what are your feelings in regards to all of this? What you're, what you're seeing displayed on the page. And you, what you want to do is try to compose a one-line summary of the scene. Compose a one-line summary of the scene. Now, what I'm going to show you is an example of all this using that Mark 3 passage that I've been using for this course uh, to give you an example. So that's where we're going to go next. But again, this is the overview of the process. You've got to identify the scenes, and then you've got to describe the scenes. It's like a two-part process, okay? So to identify the scenes, you use textual observations, what you learn in textual observations, and these different elements, time elements, pacing elements, focus elements. You use that. Then, once you have your scenes labeled, you say identified, then you've got to describe them using those, those five areas there. Um, so, let's see an example of this in Mark 3, and uh, I think this will help kind of explain what we're dealing with in terms of scene analysis. So, first of all, we look at the textual observations, right? That's one of the first things I told you to do. 
So look at, we look at the example in your notes and here on the website. You'll see that we were following the same categories that we did before. Repetition of words, contrast, comparisons. There's lists here. And I'm not going to walk through all of these because you should understand how to do that. What I, what I want you to do is make sure that you, you use those categories. Go through every category. If it doesn't apply, you can put like in slash a uh, or none. That's one thing you can do. Make sure you do label the significant verbs um, and, and identify those. But what I want to focus on is that section in the, in the text observation. You'll see it in the list here, dialogue. I want you to take a look at that, dialogue. There's, there's like five bullet points here. What I'm doing here is I'm observing the dialogue that takes place. There's Jesus' mother and half-siblings to various people. That's chapter 3, verse 21. Scribes are talking to the crowd. They're making a statement to the crowd, verse 22 and 30. There's dialogue there. Jesus and the scribes, chapters 3, verse 23, 29. And then the crowd to Jesus and Jesus to the crowd. And you see the, you see the verses there that go along with that. So when I'm looking at my narrative passage and I'm making observations, one of the things I want to be aware of is dialogue. Is there dialogue? And, and the reason we did use dialogue in the epistles is sometimes there's, there's not dialogue like there is in narrative. But in an epistle, sometimes there's this implied dialogue, like, you know, Paul talking to himself, right, in the book of Romans. So that's why we left it in there and discussed dialogue as part of the um, uh, course number one. But it really comes out. You're really going to use that category and, and find things in the narrative because there's dialogue. There's always interaction with each other, uh, dialogue with each other. But look at down below uh, at the very bottom of the textual observation list, and we have those two new categories, shifts or pivots and interchange. And so if you take a look at interchange first, there, I got three bullet points. Jesus interacting with the crowd the scribes are interacting. There's interchange between scribes and Jesus. And then there's interchange between Jesus' family, the crowd, and Jesus again. So his family, the crowd, and Jesus, they're all um, interacting together. And so it, I break down the passages there. But I'm noting, I'm noting the interchange that takes place. But if you look above and see the shifts, there's different things being done within those interchanges that provide shifts or pivots. So I start at chapter 3, verse 19 to 20, and I'm walking through the passage in the order in which it appears, and I, I notice here a shift to the crowd being in Jesus' house. Before, the crowd was not stated in the previous passage, was not stated to be in Jesus' house. That Mark is noting that, so uh, that's a shift from what was happening before to what's happening now. So the crowd in Jesus' home pivots to the statement by Jesus' family. So within that framework, the, the shift are major shifts. If you want to ask the question, what's the difference between a shift and a pivot? The shifts are major, the pivots are minor uh, in terms of things. And so they're still in the house, but they make a statement. Um, are the crowd in Jesus' house pivots to a statement by Jesus' family. Um, it, it, there's a, sh a pivot from one to the other. And then comes another shift, a shift to the scribes with, with no mention of Jesus' family. So another shift has occurred, which is a more of a major distinction. And then the scribes that assert a falsehood, that pivots to Jesus' response to them. So again, the pivots are happening within the shifts. Then Jesus' response to the scribes pivots to a, another assertion by the scribes. Then we have a shift back to the crowd being with Jesus as his family arrives. There's a major shift now. Uh, again, the shifts are major, the pifts, pivots are minor. So there's a shift back to the crowd. There's a for, more focus on the crowd being with Jesus and his family arrives. And Jesus' family calls for him, right? But that pivots to the crowd relaying the wishes of his family to Jesus. And that pivots to Jesus responding to the crowd. You have to remember that in that scene, or in that section there, there's no, um, there's no interaction between Jesus and his family directly. 
Jesus just talks to the crowd. So you're going to notice shifts and pivots. You're going to notice interchange. Shifts are major, pivots are minor. And usually there's a, you could have a shift and then pivots. And then shift, pivots. That's kind of how it works. Now, I'll tell you this. I, had, I see three shifts in this passage. And it turns out that each of the major shifts, it doesn't have to work this way, but just for this example, in Mark 3, every shift is the beginning of a new scene. That helps me, that tips me off to the beginning of a new scene, as we will see uh, when, we, when we take a look at the breakdown of the scenes. So you want to make sure you focus on all the textual observational categories, but really focus on dialogue, shifts and pivots, and interchange. Shifts are major, pivots are minor. And we'll discuss more about this in class. I know you probably will have questions. Things may not be as clear. So we'll discuss this more when we get to the class time. And, um, but again, at least try to think of it in those terms. And as you begin working on your assignment before you come to class, then you can be more aware of, maybe have a, good, have a, have a better footing and at least you had gave it an attempt uh, to, to work on the assignment and do as much as you could uh, beforehand, okay? So, shifts and pivots, interchange, and dialogue. And now we're going to move to looking at the scenes themselves. Once we break down the scenes, then we have to describe them and what that looks like. Now, when you think about the scene analysis, and uh, we're going to look at these particular aspects, we're going to break the passage down into various scenes. Now, as I went through my textual observations and looked at everything and especially noticed those shifts, I came up with three scenes. I arrived to the conclusion there were three distinct scenes in the passage. Now, sometimes you may have a passage that only has two scenes. You may ask yourself, could there be an account, a story, where there's only one scene? Possibly. But in most cases, if you're seeing, if there's only one scene, the passage that you've chosen to preach may not be, you may, you may need to expand that a little bit. It may not be the complete story. So usually there's at least two or more. But in this passage, um, we have three. And if you notice here in your notes, I've, I've broken it down into three scenes. Scene number one, scene number two, scene number three. And you remember one of the things I stated was that you need to have a one-line summary of it. Uh, I didn't start with that. That was, that was written after, <laughs> at the end of my understanding of each scene and examination of each scene. But I tried to write a one-word summary. For scene one, Jesus is accused of being irrational. Uh, chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. Scene number two, Jesus is accused of being demonic. Chapter 3, verse 22 to 30. And then uh, Jesus, number three, is accused of being unreasonable. Uh, chapter 3, verse 31 to 35. Now, you say, well, every scene is a, is a how statement? No, not necessarily. Again, we haven't gotten yet. We haven't arrived to the time when we're going to look at primary matters. We have, to, based on that chart I showed you at the beginning of the narrative course, we have to do character, setting, scenes, and, and, and then, yeah, make sure we do our significant words. But we also do uh, plot analysis. And what the character, setting, scenes, and significant words helps us it helps us get to the plot of the story, okay? Once you have the plot, then you can work towards what, why, how, to the primary matters. But you've got to get to the plot next, after that. So, again, don't think of this as three main points. Don't think of it. It could be, but at this point, I don't know. And I'm not going to make that determination. All I want to do right now is just understand what's going on in each scene. And so if you take a look at just scene number one, I want to show you scene number one. Again, we're going to talk about more of this in class. I'm going to develop it a little bit more, a lot more for you in reality. And, and so I want you to just at least get aware of this. Scene number one, Jesus is accused of being irrational. Again, I did not write that statement at the beginning. I wrote it, that statement, that one-line summary, um, after I had done all my study. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to describe the scene. In, in, in normal, everyday language. Something I can remember. So I talk about here, the crowd is so large and they're taking up most of the space in Jesus' home that Jesus is not able to eat food, right? Remember that's stated there. So I'm, I'm making 
I'm making statements here about what the passage is discussing, what's being mentioned there in the passage. However, Jesus doesn't seem to be concerned about not being able to eat. It's not a concern to him based on the passage because the assumption is that Jesus was teaching the crowd of the people at the time. He's teaching the crowd. He's, he, he's focused on teaching. He's focused on giving them God's word. And, and, and as we learned from setting analysis, there would be a home. He would have a home. He probably had food. People probably brought food or something. And, and the food being eaten is not a major deal for him. So again, what I'm trying to do here is just, in simple language, understand what's happening in the scene. I'm trying to describe it. Then Jesus' mother and half-siblings, they did not like hearing the fact that Jesus was not able to eat. They misjudged the situation to the extent that they were willing to travel from Nazareth to Capernaum, 65 to 70 kilometers, uh, two, maybe a two-day journey. Where did I learn that from? When I did setting analysis. To take him back to Nazareth and convince him that he needs to begin to think and act more rationally. They were so convinced of their viewpoint, they were even willing to tell others that Jesus was behaving irrationally. You know, it says they were saying he's, he's insane <laughs> or, you know, he's out of his mind. Um, so they're willing to express that to others. So again, what I'm doing is I'm going back to that, uh, those bullet points I gave you. I'm describing the characters and, uh, uh, at the level of their interactions with each other. So I'm trying to, trying to describe what's going on, trying to describe what they're saying, what they're doing. And, and, and so that's how I'm beginning my analysis of that particular theme, uh, scene. Uh, then, I, then I want to think a little bit more broadly and say, okay, what themes show up here? What, 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 based on what I'm learning, what I'm seeing from the passage, what's happening? Well, I've noticed two, th two themes. I try to state these very shortly or very in a short, few amount of words. I, I try to say here, misunderstanding of the nature of Jesus' ministry. You know, from a thematic point of view, the, the, Jesus' family doesn't understand his ministry. They don't get it. They don't really see what he's doing, why he's doing it. That's, that's a problem for them. And the priority of gospel preaching and teaching. Jesus is willing for the gospel to be preached before he even eats food. And some people would call that crazy. Well, his family's calling that crazy. They're saying he's literally out of his mind because he won't eat. In their view, eating is more important than preaching, than teaching, sharing the gospel. They have a misunderstanding of it. So from a thematic purpose uh, of this, I want to think about that. Why am I doing that? Because it's going to help me down the road when I have to put my sermon together. I can go back to this information. So what are my thoughts and emotions about all that? How, do I, how does that hit me? How does that make me feel? And, and what does it make me think? See, now I'm trying to personalize it. And I'm not just saying, I'm not trying to do this, read the story and say, what does it matter to me? Or what does it say to me? I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to, after exegeting it, after trying to really examine it and understand what's going on, it's got to have an effect on me. It's got to affect how I think and, and how I feel. Truth does engage your mind, engage your heart. And so I try to express in some words my thoughts and emotions. Uh, I say this, many only regard as a priority what they see and feel. I can sense that from the actions and the language of, of Jesus' family. Many have difficulty comprehending the issues of eternal life and death. Why is Jesus giving the gospel? Why is he teaching people? Because he wants them to know the truth. He wants their lives to be saved. He wants them to go to heaven. He doesn't want uh, to them to, f to fall under judgment of sin, eternal death. That's why this is important to him. And many have difficulty comprehending the, the importance of that. Many feel that those who prioritize the ministry of preaching the gospel should be forced to rethink their life. That's what's really going on for uh, Jesus, Mary, and, and the siblings, half-siblings. They think Jesus should rethink his life. And they're even willing to make a journey to Capernaum to, to, to stop him, to force him to rethink his life. You know, you preach the gospel, you teach the gospel, and there may be people who think you're loony, that you're crazy for doing this. 
Why don't you get a real job? Don't be a pastor. Get a real job that pays you money so you can live in this world. Why are you pastoring and shepherding? Why are you preaching? There's no, there's no glory in it. There's no pay in it. There's a lot of heartache. Why do this? Jesus understood. His family did not. You may can relate to that. So again, what I'm trying to do here is, is, is relate personally to what I'm learning, to be able to express it. Why am I doing this? Because that's going to help me in my sermon content document. It's going to help me when I have to do the preparation for that down, uh, down the road. Even though, I, another couple of statements here, even though we must eat and take care of ourselves physically, I must always place the Lord's will above my own. I believe that we should understand what biblical ministry is really about, what it's really concerning. So I, and I could add more to this. I could maybe even edit this. I mean, these are my first thoughts and emotions that I thought through that came to my mind based on seeing those themes and seeing the development of the action and the dialogue that took place in that passage. Again, at this point, I don't know the structure of my sermon. I have not determined that yet. I don't know fully the what, why, how. I will get there. But I'm trying to begin to understand each scene, what it means, what's going on, and how does that affect me at a personal level? And if I do this, it really helps prepare me for when it's time to preach. And I do have that structure. And I do have that development. And after that, after I do all that, then I go back and I write that little one statement summary. Jesus is accused of being irrational. He's accused by his family of being irrational because they say he is out of his mind. So that's my description of scene number one. So I did textual observations, looked at dialogue especially, shifts and pivots, interchange. And then I determined three scenes. And then once I have each scene and I have the verse reference, then I begin that process. Looking at the characters, the events, the dialogue, and just explaining that a little bit more. And then looking at the themes that result from that, my thoughts and emotions regarding that and then doing a one-line summary. So I go in that order, even though here in the, in the example, the, what, what I did at the very end shows up at the very beginning. It's just the way to make it look on your assignment. I would think, you know, you make it look like that, but again, that's the last thing you'll do is the one-line uh, statement. I did the same, as you can see, for scene two and for scene three. I'm just walking through that same procedure. So when we have our class time this week, um, when we meet again and we talk about scene analysis, I'll review a lot of this, but begin working on your assignment for this. Take your passage, begin trying to determine what are the scenes, do the textual observations, use uh, the, the resources that you have in your manual to do this, and then bring that to class with you because it'll help you based on doing this, then coming to class and seeing the dialogue we have and the discussions that we have and the workshop. It's going to help make this make more sense to you about the procedure okay so that's scene analysis hopefully it's been helpful and look forward to seeing you in in class